very much. So this talk will be about a new quantum algorithm that we uh, developed and then implemented for random sampling. And it's intended to have three key features. First, it's meant to be natural to implement on current and near-term quantum devices. Second, it's meant to not be completely heuristic, but rather to have some formal guarantees of producing the right answer. And finally, it's meant to be eventually useful in that it solves some problem of pre-existing interest. So here's the plan for today. The talk is a mix of theory and experiment. I'm going to start out by introducing the sampling problem in question and the classical algorithms that are currently used to solve it. This will lead naturally into our quantum algorithm, and then we'll take that for a spin, no pun intended, uh, in both simulations and experiments. So I'd like to start by diving into some math to get that out of the way and then taking a step back for context. So the underlying setting that we'll be dealing with is the classical Ising model, where every model instance is defined by a function like this, which is in turn defined by coefficients j and h that are given to us as part of the problem specification. Now, together, these define this function E of s that's often called an energy function, and it assigns some real scalar value called an energy to every n-bit string s, and these bits are sometimes called spins. Now, it's convenient and common to squint a little bit and visualize this function as representing a sort of landscape in 1D like this. And this energy function is not a probability distribution, but it does in turn define the distribution that we'll be interested in, namely the corresponding Boltzmann distribution, which assigns some probability mu of s to every bit string s that goes just like the negative exponential of the energy of that string. Now the z or z out front here uh, is just a normalizing factor, it's called the partition function, and the parameter t is sometimes called the temperature, and you can also just think of it as some problem parameter, some positive number that's given to us as part of the specification. So what does this Boltzmann distribution look like? Well, in the low temperature limit, it becomes very sharply peaked over the global minimum of this energy function. In the opposite high temperature limit, it instead approaches the uniform distribution over all n-bit strings. The regime that we'll be most interested in is this hard intermediate regime, where the Boltzmann distribution instead has substantial weight over a number of different low energy regions within this landscape that could be far from one another in Hamming distance. Now, these, equa these equations are deceptively simple, uh, and in fact, this Boltzmann distribution can be uh, quite hard to work with computationally. And to give you a flavor of why, uh, consider this normalizing factor, this partition function z, uh, which involves a sum over every possible bit string, of which there are exponentially many. And so it means that, in general, we can't evaluate this normalizing factor efficiently, which means that, in general, we can't actually evaluate these Boltzmann probabilities, the actual numbers. Nonetheless, the task we're considering is to sample from this distribution, by which I mean the goal is to output random n-bit strings such that the probability of me giving you some n-bit string s is equal to the corresponding Boltzmann probability of s, perhaps to within some desired error tolerance. The main figure of merit that we'll be concerned with is the number of computational steps required to produce these samples. And if you've never encountered this problem before, it might seem esoteric to you. Um, I assure you that it's not, though. It actually arises in a few different applications. So historically, this first came up in physics, where the Ising model was proposed as an early model of magnetism and materials. And the Boltzmann distribution just uh, represents uh, the, uh, the thermal distribution. Now, where the sampling bit comes in is if you wanted to compute the thermal average of some physical quantity f, for instance, magnetization. So what you could do is just explicitly evaluate the expression for the, the expectation value, which involves a sum over exponentially many terms. But an alternative that's often much computationally cheaper is if you could just sample from this Boltzmann distribution, you could approximate the thermal average by just uniformly averaging over these samples. Now, this exact same trick is used in machine learning, specifically in Boltzmann machines, classical Boltzmann machines, uh, which are just classical Ising models that are invoked for generative modeling. And this exact sampling trick is used both in the inference and in the uh, training steps, and it can be a bottleneck in both. Finally, I'd like to take a moment and uh, uh, emphasize that sampling is not the same as optimization in general. Uh, however, it is often used as a subroutine in combinatorial optimization, uh, most famously as part of this simulated annealing algorithm, where the idea is to sample from the Boltzmann distribution and gradually decreasing temperatures in the hopes of ultimately finding the global ground state. 
But to remind you of the challenge that we face in all these applications, um, because we can actually evaluate these Boltzmann probabilities, in some sense, we want to sample from this blue distribution without really being able to see it. So how do we do this? Well, there are a number of different classical strategies for sampling from distributions of interest. The one that is uh, most common here that works well typically in high dimensional settings like this one is called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC for short. The idea is simply to do a random walk over the space of n bit strings. So if your current configuration is shown by this black dot here, uh, in the first iteration you start there, you then make a random jump somewhere else and another random jump and so on. Now, if at each iteration you pick you picked your next state uniformly at random, you'd find that in the long run you tend to spend about the same amount of time at every one of these n bit strings. Of course, if you pick the transition probabilities such that you jumped in some directions more often than others, you would find correspondingly that you might start spending more time at some states and less at others. And so the idea of MCMC is simply to pick these transition probabilities carefully such that the fraction of time that I spend at any given n-bit string approaches the Boltzmann probability of that same n-bit string. Now, the natural question here, of course, is uh, how do I pick these transition probabilities? That seems like it might be computationally hard. And amazingly, actually, it's not. There is a trick that dates back to Los Alamos in the early 50s. And the idea is to break down each one of these random jumps into two steps. So in step one, you take your current state and by some means you propose a new state S prime. And I'll elaborate on this in a moment. Then you go to step two in which you compute this number A called the acceptance probability that's always between zero and one. Then with probability A, you actually make the jump. Otherwise you stay put. And in any case, you return to the next cycle. And it turns out that if you just iterate through these two steps under very mild assumptions about the, the mechanism in step one, you will eventually converge to the Boltzmann distribution. Now, you might be looking at the acceptance probability here and be worried, right? Because I, I motivated this by saying that we couldn't actually evaluate mu of s or mu of s prime, these Boltzmann probabilities in general. Um, but something remarkable happens, which is that if you actually write out this fraction, the, uh, the normalizing factor, this partition function drops out. And what you're left with is just the quantity that can be evaluated in at most quadratic time. And so this is what really enables the whole thing. And this is a very powerful technique. It works very well in many settings. And when it doesn't work so well, it's often still the best tool at our disposal. Now, when I say it doesn't work so well, the issue is that it can converge quite slowly. And generically, this happens when you have a rough kind of glassy energy landscape like I'm showing here uh, with no particular symmetry in your problem instance and a relatively low temperature. And the issue is that your random walk has a tendency to kind of get stuck around the orbit of deep local minima. Uh, and this happens uh, more or less across the board, uh, regardless of how you're proposing moves in step one uh, for, for most known algorithms. So for instance, the most common way of proposing moves is to just take a local approach. So to take your current spin configuration to just flip one of the bits. Now, uh, this is nice because you only tend to move a little bit in energy along the y-axis here. Uh, so such moves are reasonably likely to be accepted. But on the other hand, you only move a little bit in Hamming distance too, a Hamming distance of one along the x-axis. And so it means that to escape from a deep local minimum, you typically need a sequence of such moves to be accepted. Uh, which doesn't happen very often, and so you tend to get stuck in this situation for long stretches. You could imagine instead using a non-local approach to suggest moves, uh, of which there are several, but for illustration, let's just consider the opposite extreme of this, in which you pick your next move uniformly at random. This is kind of a Hail Mary approach, right? It's, uh, you jump a large distance along the x-axis, so if it works, it works great. Um, it just tends not to work very often. And the reason why is because such moves tend to be sharply uphill, and so they're overwhelmingly unlikely to be accepted. Intuitively, what you'd want is something that kind of combines the best of both of these. Some means of proposing moves such that um, the, uh, the distance that you move along the y-axis in energy is relatively small, so that the moves are reasonably likely to be accepted. And yet, um, you have a tendency to jump a large Hamming distance which brings you not necessarily to the ground state or anything like that, but at least uh, quickly between different low energy regions of this landscape. And that's what we end up finding in our quantum algorithm. So uh, to, to dive into that, the basic idea is that we use our quantum processor 
to uh, propose new moves, and then we use a classical computer to efficiently accept or reject them. Now, there are many reasonable ways to do this. Um, the one that I'll focus on today starts with preparing a computational state S, if S is your current n-bit string of your random walk, or your Markov chain, um, then evolving by the transverse field Ising model corresponding to the classical model instance that you're giving. Um, so the diagonal terms of your Hamiltonian are just the classical energies, and the off-diagonal ones are kind of a kinetic energy-like term or a, a graph Laplacian on a hypercube, if you prefer. Um, finally, you measure in the computational basis, and the bit string that you get out of this single measurement you call S prime. Um, if, you, uh, if you're a condensed matter physicist, you could think of this as a quench experiment. If you're a computer scientist, you could think of it as querying the classical energy function in quantum superposition. Now, in any case, you return to the classical computer now and compute the acceptance probability, which I've now written out in quantum notation. Now, you should see this fraction in blue and be a little worried about that, because to get the right acceptance probability that ensures convergence, I need to compute uh, this fraction that involves a ratio of quantum transition probabilities uh, for, uh, or that, that in general we don't expect uh, to be able to evaluate efficiently. But again, something remarkable happens, which is that you can prove for this Hamiltonian that these two terms have to be equal. So this fraction is equal to one. And so even though the numerator and the denominator are both hard, uh, you don't actually have to worry about either of them. What you're left with is something that takes quadratic time to evaluate. And finally, you go to the next state with probability A, uh, or you go to the state with probability A, otherwise you stay put and you keep iterating. Now, assuming it's hard to sample from the measurement distribution of this time-evolved quantum state, it means that what we're effectively doing here is creating a Markov chain that is hard to mimic classically, and yet it inherits the uh, uh, convergence guarantees from uh, the classical formalism of MCMC, meaning this is an algorithm that you might call semi-heuristic in that the ultimate convergence is guaranteed, but how fast you converge is something that must be established empirically much like most classical MCMC algorithms. Now, as a quantum algorithm, this one is also a bit unusual. So for one, there's no variational optimization here. There's no adiabatic component. Uh, and perhaps most strangely, uh, there is no expectation value uh, to be estimated here. We really directly use the quantum computer for what it does most naturally, which is generating complicated random transitions between n-bit strings. And because of the uh, inherent stochastic nature of this algorithm, we end up finding in our experiments that it's quite robust to noise. And you might say that it fails gracefully in the sense that uh, the impact of experimental imperfections ends up making the algorithm look more and more classical as opposed to actually driving you towards the wrong answer. So, um, so now let's, uh, let's jump into some simulations and finally some experiments. So what we did in simulations is generate a large number of random uh, problem instances. And uh, for the experts among you, we looked at the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And this left us with two knobs to control the problem difficulty. So what we're going to look at is the average convergence rate over these different instances, and look at how that changes as we turn both these knobs. Now, the first way we'll visualize this is by taking a vertical slice through this parameter space, namely holding the problem size fixed but varying the temperature. And so we get a plot that looks like this, where I'm showing convergence rate on the y-axis, so high is good, versus temperature on the x-axis. And here I'm just showing this for the most common uh, classical strategy for MCMC, where you see that at intermediate temperatures, the convergence is quite fast, but it falls off sharply at both high and low extremes. You can also look at a slice that goes the other way, namely holding the temperature fixed but varying the problem size. And so here you see that for the same classical method that the convergence rate decays roughly exponentially on average with the problem size. We can compare this with the kind of the opposite extreme classical approach I mentioned earlier. Um, and you get kind of a similar result here. So on the left uh, panel, you end up with faster convergence at high and low temperatures, but about the same in the middle. And on the right panel, we see again, exponential decay on average um, with in fact a slope that's marginally worse. Now, for comparison, our quantum algorithm, uh, our numerics give us these red lines here, where in the left panel, you see that as we enter this kind of spin glass regime, uh, we still get a slowdown in our convergence rate, but not nearly as pronounced as these classical algorithms. 
And in the right panel, we see that it is still exponentially slow uh, within this regime, at least. Um, but based on, but uh, fitting this data as well as other similar numerical data uh, suggests a speed up that is polynomial uh, that is roughly between cubic and quartic. So um, with the time I have remaining, let me then show you how this plays out in experiments. So what we did was um, we implemented, we are actually, I should say, in the, the paper, if you'd like, there are other experiments, but the one I'll focus on here uses 10 superconducting qubits on one of IBM's quantum processors. And um, the error rates are state of the art. And so this led us to a trotterized uh, um, evolution for the quantum step of this algorithm using up to 48 layers of parallel two qubit gates. Uh, now, the reason we're able to get to such relatively deep circuits and still have a nice signal by the end of it uh, is twofold. So we used extensive random compilation or noise twirling. And uh, most crucially, the two qubit gate that shows up in the trotterization uh, of this transverse field Ising model is an RZZ rotation by some small angle theta that depends on the different pairs of qubits. So the textbook way of doing this would be to do a pair of C knots with a single qubit gate in the middle, uh, so two fully entangling gates. And what we did instead was uh, take the pulses that are used to generate a C naught and instead just cut them short. And so to directly do um, a, a, a slightly entangling gate as opposed to two fully entangling gates, which can be done much, much faster and, and therefore has much higher fidelity. So, um, so we did this throughout. And to show you how this plays out, I'll plot again convergence rate versus temperature for an illustrative model instance on 10 spins. So here I'm showing again these two extreme classical strategies, and the, uh, the ideal version of our quantum algorithm gives us this red dotted line, uh, whereas the experimental implementation gives us this solid red line, which as you can see in kind of the low T glassy regime is slower than the noiseless case, but still substantially faster than both of these quantum algorithms, as, as well as about half a dozen other more sophisticated MCMC algorithms that I haven't gotten into here just for the sake of simplicity. So uh, to show this off a little more concretely, all right, um, to show this off a little more concretely, what we did was use our algorithm to estimate the classical magnet average magnetization in this classical Ising model. So the magnetization is just the fraction of upspins minus the fraction of downspins, and we're interested in the Boltzmann average of it. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a typical application of MCMC. You try to generate samples that approximately follow the Boltzmann distribution, and you compute a running average, and this should eventually converge towards the true value of the Boltzmann average magnetization. We did this for a temperature of uh, 0 0.1, which is kind of a Goldilocks temperature where it's high enough that we're quite far from being an optimization problem, but low enough that the, uh, that the Boltzmann distribution has weight mostly on the four lowest energy states, uh, all of which are local minima. So uh, in fact, this problem kind of looks like this cartoon I've been showing throughout. And if we look at the current magnetization versus the number of iterations, just for the simple classical algorithm, where I've labeled the ground first, second, and third excited state, we find that it quickly finds its way down into a local minimum. Here it's the uh, third excited state, and basically stays there. And if you compute the running average estimate for magnetization using a number of Markov chains like this, you see that it doesn't really look to converge to the true value. Now, of course, we know we can prove that it must converge. Um, it just takes much longer. It takes on the order of tens of millions of time steps to get there. We can use the other opposite extreme classical approach and we get kind of similar results where we find that you stay stuck for on the order of hundreds of time steps um, and converge over a similar time scale. And finally, what I'm showing in red here is experimental data for our quantum algorithm, where we find that we're quickly jumping uh, between these various low-lying uh, local minima. Um, and as a result, we end up with quite a fast mixing Markov chain that converges uh, within the order of hundreds of time steps. So in the interest of time, I'll skip this. This is basically just saying that our data looks basically like this, this figure I had earlier. And to wrap up, let me just conclude by saying that Current quantum processors, for all their limitations, are good at sampling from complicated distributions. And what we've effectively done here is add a careful, efficient classical outer loop in order to leverage its ability to do something useful. 
And so in the end, what this gives us is a path to sampling from distributions that actually arise in, in uh, applications as opposed to ones that are meant to just be adversarially hard. So on that note, thank you very much.